Hey everybody, this is Roy Canning, and today I'm taking a look at Lord of the Rings, a miniatures game battle in Balin's tomb. Let's see what I think. So let's take a look at Battle in Balin's Tomb here. You will have to assemble the miniatures before you can play the game. So this is Games Workshop style stuff. You're going to have to cut all the stuff out and then be able to put them all together. And I used a little bit of super glue to make sure everything stayed together. So if you're not used to modeling, that might be a little bit of an issue for you. But for me, it wasn't too big of a deal. So let's look here. You have all of your fellowship characters and then all of the goblins that kind of start there. And it's kind of cool. The board actually says on it exactly kind of where your characters are supposed to start. But as you play the game, as the heroes, you're basically trying to survive the 12 rounds. And as the goblins, you're trying to take out at least three or get them down below three heroes. If you um, get them to three heroes and Frodo is not defeated, the heroes are still going to win. If you defeat Frodo and then there are still three heroes left, then um, basically the fellowship and the bad guys, you basically have a draw. But if you get them like down to two, then the goblins are going to win overall because you have beaten enough of the fellowship to knock it out. Uh, most of the game is basically done with regular movement. Um, so each character here is going to have several different stats. So let's take a look at Frodo here. So Frodo has a move of four. He rolls one die for attacking, two dice for defending, and he has two wounds. That means he basically has two hit points before he gets destroyed. Um, then he also has an ability here. You can only attack... Frodo, if you're actually adjacent to him, so their archery and things like that are not going to work, or their spearmen who can attack from a space away, they're going to have to actually get beside him to attack him. And then a lot of the characters have these different abilities here with the ring. If they roll the ring side on the die, they're going to be able to trigger those. Frodo's here is that um, if he rolls a ring when doing a defense roll, basically all of the um, attacks are ignored, or all the damage is ignored, and you can move Frodo um, three spaces. So there's all sorts of cool special abilities that happen on these characters when they roll that ring symbol on the die for the heroes. Um, so basically, combat is extremely simple. Let's take a look how that works. So every character has their little stats here on their dice. Um, Aragorn has a move of six, an attack of three, and a defense of three. So that means when he's attacking one of these goblins, he's going to roll three dice, and he's basically looking for sword symbols on the dice. So if he had sword symbols, then you would go and check for the bad guys. They would then be able to roll. Most of the goblins only have one defense die, so if I had two swords, it's mostly going to knock them out. But um, they could have an opportunity to roll multiple shields, um, especially if they were the um, goblin that has a shield there. Then they could uh, basically re-roll to try to get extra shield with defense. But that's if I only had one sword, maybe they could roll and try to block my damage. If you have more swords than their stuff, than their defense, they're going to take wounds. Um, each of the goblins only has one hit point, so they'll be knocked out. But like Aragorn here could take up to three wounds to be able to um, survive. When the goblins would attack him, like if the, the shield guy attacked Aragorn, he would roll his two attack. If he rolled shields, it wouldn't do anything for him. But for each sword, I would have to roll a defense or a ring in combat. The ring can be used as any symbol to block those attacks. Also with the, um, the enemy dice, if you roll the little Eye of Sauron there, those are basically wilds as well. So basically you're just trying to get more hits than their defense and to be able to inflict wounds on them. If you take wounds equal to the number of wounds you have there, then you are knocked out and that piece is removed from the game. So that's basically how combat works. Some characters have range, so you have the little um, goblin guys with a bow and then of course Legolas and then the hobbits, a lot of them can throw um, stuff as well. So um, basically range, you just draw from a line from the middle of the square to um, the square they're trying to attack. So, and also um, basically line of sight is only blocked by certain things like there are pillars on the edges of the boards and then things like that. And there's also a little bit of elevation with the um, stairs and stuff around the board. But also, um, if a line of sight goes across a large character to try to attack a small character, like a hobbit or a, hobbit or a goblin, then that line of sight would be broken. But you can always attack a big character. So this um, archer couldn't attack um, Pippin back here. But if Gandalf was back here, the archer could still attack Gandalf because he is a larger character. So depending on that, can kind of depend on the line of sight a little bit. And then it works the exact same way. You're rolling for attack, and then defense is being rolled back. 
if swords are reached and you try to see if you can actually wound the characters. There is a round tracker here that um, basically you're trying to get to the end of the 12 rounds here. Um, basically at the beginning of each turn the goblins are going to start each turn and they're going to be drawing cards here and you can see here um, this shows the cards that they actually draw each turn. So on the second turn, they're going to draw one goblin card. Third turn, they draw one. Fourth turn, they draw one. Fifth turn, they draw one. Then the sixth and seventh, they draw two, and so on and so forth. So as the turns go along, they're going to be drawing more and more of the cards from the goblin deck here. So there are all sorts of different cards that they'll draw. Also, when you start the game, you're going to kind of prep this with the cave troll card that can make the cave troll come out kind of somewhere in like the top half of the cards pretty much. Um, and then you'll draw a card, and these will say things like, hey, a player puts Moria Goblins, puts a Moria Goblin next to the well. So the well is on the other side of the board down here, and they would just be able to place one of their guys beside the well, which could end up making them pop up behind the Fellowship, and now I have more Goblins popping up everywhere to be able to try to shoot out and attack my opponents um, as the Goblin player. And if I ever get the Cave Troll card out, then the Cave Troll would actually come up um, on the board. A thing to note is if the cave troll comes out and there are people in the troll space here, the cave troll actually runs them over and kills them. So you have to kind of try to keep your goblins off of that space so they don't get destroyed by the cave troll, but he will be nasty when he actually comes out. Plus he actually gets to roll a gray dice as well for his defense. And then if you are actually adjacent to them, you get to roll a gray dice for your attack. And the gray dice is cool because it actually has two wounds on it. So that way you can do a little bit of extra damage to those heroes and be able to mess up everything for the fellowship. One thing I will note about the turn tracker is I really wish that they had um, the, the number of goblin cards like actually beside here. Just like a number of pips or something like that along this to be like, okay, in these turns you draw one card, in these turns you draw two cards, in the last couple turns you draw three cards for the goblin cards. Just because it's, it's annoying to have to like look back in the rule book to remember how many goblin cards that are going to be drawn to bring the goblins out each turn. So um, that would be kind of cool. You do have wound tokens as well in the game. Whenever you take damage from those hits um, that you're not able to defend, you'll put wound tokens on there. If you have the last one, you're going to um, basically remove that character from the board. And then if you're the Fellowship, if you've gone below three characters, you've lost. Um, but if you're, a, if you're the bad guys or the, the Moria guys, you're basically going to take them off. But they'll probably be coming right back on the board very shortly as the uh, beginning of the next turn because goblins just keep on coming and coming out of all the different crevices here in Bottoms 2. We're gonna take a real quick look at all of the characters and kind of show off their special abilities a little bit. So Frodo, of course, has the special ability where if he rolls a ring in defense, he basically ignores all the rest of the damage. Um, Gandalf has some abilities where he can move goblins around the board a little bit. He's got the three defense, so he's a little bit tougher. Um, and if he rolls the ring when making an attack, he can immediately make another attack to an enemy five spaces away. So he can kind of like blast people with some magic, pretty cool stuff there. Then you have Gimli, who basically he ignores hits against him, or the regular goblin hits against him. Um, and when he rolls a ring in a defense roll, he can ignore an additional um, hit from the troll, so he's able to ignore some of the troll's attacks as well. And then we have Boromir. He's really awesome because uh, the Fellowship may re-roll when they are making defense rolls while they're adjacent to Boromir, so Boromir kind of protects those around him. And then if he rolls when making the ring when making an attack roll, he may um, bash one of the goblins with his shield, and he pushes them one square away from Boromir. Um, then Pippin, um, basically Pippin and Merry are basically the same thing. Um, they can throw stones at a enemy five squares away, so they'll be able to roll attacks um, at range a little bit. And if he rolls a ring when making a defense roll, he can choose it to be two defense instead of just one defense. And then Sam here, he rolls, um, he can make attacks for five squares away as well. And if he rolls a ring when making an attack roll against an adjacent enemy, he immediately move one space and make another attack. So Sam can run around smashing people with a pan. On the have leg list, he can make attack rolls um, if he can see an enemy regardless of the distance. Um, the enemy is not an adjacent square. He uses three dice instead of just two. So Legless, of course, is better at ranged. And if he rolls the ring, he can make an attack roll against a non-adjacent enemy. He may immediately attack another enemy um, non-adjacent to that. Um, the attack extra attack uses just one thing. So he can attack multiple people. Um, Mary's the same as Pippin. He gets to do the extra defense thing. Then we have Aragorn, who is better adjacent to people. He rolls three dice um, for his attack. Um, so he can attack them if he can see them at range, but he only rolls two instead of three. And then if he rolls a ring, 
um, making an attack roll, he can choose it to represent two swords instead of another result. That'd be awesome. Um, then the Moria Goblin with the spear. Um, these guys can attack from two squares away, so they have reach. So they can kind of reach and grab your guys, but of course only one hit point with the little goblins there. And these shield guys are kind of annoying. They have two attack, and then they can re-roll um, defense rolls against you. Um, so they are a little bit more beefy with their defense rolls. And then the Moria Goblins can attack at range. Um, they can attack anyone they can see. And for the most part, the board's pretty open, so they can see almost anybody. Um, and then Cave Trolls. Um, this uh, has six movement, two attack. If he's adjacent, he gets to roll the gray dice for attack instead of just the regular two attack. And he has he can attack people up to three squares away. And uh, he has a defense of the two red dice and a gray dice and five wounds. Ah, the cave troll. They have a cave troll. Um, but yeah, that's basically all the characters. We can look a little bit at the miniatures here. These are Games Workshop style miniatures. They are from their Lord of the Rings miniatures game. Um, so normal hard plastic, pretty good quality. Um, but you do have to like figure out a way to protect them because this stuff will snap if it's bent too far. That sort of stuff. But the cave troll is particularly cool um, just because he has his stuff. You can actually do a spear or he actually comes with a hammer as well that you could put in his hand if you want to have the hammer and instead you can kind of kit it out the way you want to when you're building all the stuff. So that's basically all this stuff for the Lord of the Rings um, battle in Balin's tomb. Let's take a look and see what I think about the game. So Battle in Balin's Tomb is pretty interesting overall. I mean, it's mostly just little miniatures and stuff like that with attack and defense. You have a little bit of tactical movement around, but there is also a deck of these goblin cards that you're kind of going through as the goblins are kind of spawning out over and over again. There's not a whole lot of meaningful choices that you really make in the game. It's kind of like, okay, goblins pop up here or there. The goblin player kind of moves them forward and then attacks you. Um, and your goblins die and die and die, but then the fellowship is trying to figure out how to kind of get their guys in a little bit of spaces, maybe getting some guys around Boromir, getting Frodo over there beside Boromir so he can be protected with a little bit of extra re-rolling of defense dice and stuff like that. The goblins are going to all swarm on Frodo to try to take him out because it's basically, if they kill Frodo, then the uh, fellowship can't win the game at all. Um, overall, there's not a whole lot going on in the game. You're just rolling dice back and forth. I do like the dice. They're really cool as far as like the symbols and stuff on them. I like custom dice and those are super chunky. And I really enjoy the miniatures as well just because I enjoy um, Games Workshop stuff. The miniatures are really good quality. But the gameplay itself, like would I buy this game for the gameplay itself? Not at all. I'm a huge fan of Lord of the Rings. I love the Lord of the Rings IP. I love games themed in Lord of the Rings. But this, I love the Battle of Balin's Tomb also. But the thing is, there's not a whole lot of choices you're really making in this game. It really comes down to just randomness of die rolls. If this game was like geared a little bit more towards kids, so it didn't have as much um, of the special abilities or as much reading and stuff on there, I could maybe give it a little bit more of a pass. But the fact that it has special abilities that you don't really get to choose when you're doing them, they just randomly pop up on dice, and majority of the time when they happen, it's like, well, I didn't really need that to happen. There's a lot of things that look like they would be cooler than they actually are. Games Workshop kind of uses these games to try to kind of get people into their miniatures lines and things like that. This is like, oh, this would be an accessible way to get into the Lord of the Rings miniatures game. I don't think this is really that at all. Um, it's really just a game where you move forward and roll some dice and see what happens. And for me, as far as gaming goes, I like there to be meaningful choices that you make in games and exciting things that you get to do from turn to turn and you can outthink your opponent in different ways. I played this game with my dad a few times and it just really felt like we were, it was just randomly rolling whatever you got. I do love the theme and the feel of Lord of the Rings, but this is going to have to be a pass from me um, overall. I mean, I would love to see a game with this IP, like have um, amazing stuff. Even just the Balin's Tomb setting is like a really exciting thing, and there's a lot of really cool mechanics you can apply to that sort of thing. But for me, Balin's Tomb is going to be a miss, not something I would recommend really picking up at all. Um, you're just going to be chucking dice. And if that's what you're into, it might be fun for you if you just want something to waste your time and see who wins. But I feel like there's a lot of other games out there that can give you a lot more bang for your buck than this one does. Anyway, that's been my thoughts on Lord of the Rings Balin's Tomb. I really would hope to see some cooler games with this setting on it. What's your favorite Lord of the Rings game out there? Check that out in the comments below. Make sure to leave your comments for that as well. And so people that want to see Lord of the Rings games can see what really awesome ones are out there. Anyway, this has been Roy Canny, and I'll see you on the next one.